does a cherry tomato that's purple on the inside taste any better than a cherry tomato that's say orange or red on the inside? What's up Lazy Dog fam? Hope all y'all are having a fantastic day. It is Thursday, July 25th here in South Georgia. And as the title of this video suggests, today we're going to give our honest, unbiased, complete, exhaustive review of this GMO purple tomato that we grew this year. So recently I posted a little short one minute video on our social media pages talking about this tomato here and it was obvious to me from the responses and questions we got that I should do a more detailed review so that's what we're going to do here. Now back in the spring when we decided to grow this purple tomato we did a video talking about what makes this tomato unique and I gave you my stance on GMOs in general and I want to recap some of that real quick before we get into the performance of these plants and the fruits themselves. So this is the first GMO tomato where seeds have been available for backyard gardeners or home gardeners to grow. There have been GMO tomatoes in the past, but they weren't really picked up. They weren't really well received by the consumers, and so they never really took off. This one here, when these seeds were available back in the spring, anybody could go online and buy these. No matter if you just had a tiny little garden or if you were trying to grow these commercially. This is also the first tomato that is purple inside and out. Now the outside of mine look a little more brown than purple right now. We'll address that in a minute. But it's the first tomato that has a purple inside. Now we had several people comment on our short video saying, oh, there's a bunch of purple tomato varieties out there like black creme and Cherokee purple. Well, I've grown both of those. And if you cut open the inside, it's more dark red. It's not bright purple like this one here is. And so the way the seed breeders were able to engineer a purple interior on this tomato is they spliced in a gene from a purple snapdragon. So that's what makes this GMO or transgenic. You're splicing in a gene from an unrelated species, snapdragon, into a tomato. So why would you want to do that? Why would you want to make a purple tomato other than the fact that it just looks pretty? Well, purple vegetables have a compound called anthocyanin and all the health benefits of anthocyanin are well reported. So having a tomato with a purple interior means a higher anthocyanin content, which means it's supposedly more healthy than a red tomato. And so that's what makes this particular GMO a lot different than a lot of the other GMOs grown today. GMO cotton, which is grown all around us here in South Georgia, is engineered to be resistant to glyphosate. So they don't have to get in there and cultivate the weeds. They can just spray the entire field with glyphosate. It'll kill the weeds, but it won't kill the cotton. And then you've got GMO corn, which is also grown all around us here in South Georgia. Some of your GMO corn is glyphosate resistant, much like the cotton. They can spray the corn with glyphosate, kills the weeds, doesn't kill the corn. There's also BT corn, which has BT inside the corn plant. So those farmers don't have to worry about corn earworms eating on their corn. So until this little guy was developed, most of your GMOs were fostering increased herbicide usage or some type of chemical compound being inside the plant. But this one's different because this one is supposedly supposed to be more healthy than the alternative, a traditional tomato that doesn't have as much anthocyanin. Now you can buy all that if you want or you can say it's all hogwash. I'm not here to try to convince you one way or the other. I'm just listing what the proponents of this particular tomato are claiming about it. Now on that first video we did back in the spring, I also gave you my stance on GMOs in general to kind of explain why I wasn't scared to grow this GMO purple tomato here. So in my opinion, GMOs are impossible to avoid unless you just force yourself to live in a bubble, you're probably going to eat some GMO corn or something that was made with GMO corn. Your clothes, surely you've got some clothes that are made with cotton. Those are probably made with GMO cotton. So really tough to avoid GMOs altogether because they're all around us. 
and personally i'm not really worried about eating gmos i know some people say they have allergic reactions to them and that's awful but i know i've eaten plenty of gmos over the years and they haven't seemed to bother me yet yes we don't know what the long-term health effects of eating gmos are yet but like i said can't really get away from them you're going to eat them whether you really want to or not but I am worried about some of the rampant herbicide use that accompanies a lot of these GMO crops. I know there's been issues in the past with pigweed becoming resistant to glyphosate because they were using the glyphosate so much the pigweed kind of built up a resistance to it. I don't think that's a great thing. I also understand there have been quite a few situations where there's been some corporate bullying by the companies who have developed the GMOs for little guys who are trying to save and maintain the purity of their own seed stock. So now that we've covered all that background info, let's get into the actual review of the variety of the plants and of the fruits here. So to start off this review, it's important to note that the seeds for this purple tomato here were pretty expensive. I think I paid 20 bucks for a packet of say eight or 10 seeds. So you're looking at about $2 a seed. Also important to note, I usually don't mind paying top dollar for seeds if they perform for me. These Torangina cherry tomatoes here, these little orange cherry tomatoes that we really like to grow are pretty expensive as well. Not quite as expensive as these, but these are pretty expensive. But I grow them every single year. I pay for the seeds every single year because I know this variety performs for us. Same thing with those seedless watermelons we grow. Seedless watermelon seeds are really, really pricey, but we get some really, really good watermelons when we grow out those seeds now when we planted these two dollar seeds we got a very poor germination rate and for the seeds that did germinate they were very very slow to germinate now we had these in the same greenhouse with all our other tomatoes that we planted in the spring so we had a good side-by-side -side comparison and these things just didn't germinate very well at all i think i had three or four seeds out of the entire pack that actually germinated and once they did germinate the seedlings didn't have a lot of vigor they were really really slow to grow so if you've been following our channel for a while you've probably seen our injection system that we have in the greenhouse there where we can inject liquid fertilizer through our watering wand and feed those small transplants and really grow out some beautiful looking tomato transplants and a bunch of other stuff. For some reason, these purple GMO tomato seeds did not respond to my usual transplant or seedling fertilization program. I tried to push them as much as I could and they were just on their own little pace, growing really, really slow. They did eventually get to transplant size, but it took a lot longer Longer than it does with most tomatoes we grow and like I said I think I ended up with three viable transplants out of that whole pack of seeds I planted now once we put those three plants in the ground and these are them right behind me here they actually started doing a lot better they responded well for whatever reason to our fertilization in the raised bed here whereas they weren't responding to it in the greenhouse there so once i transplanted them i was able to push them pretty hard and they took off after that so here you can see those three plants in the cages on this side of that raised bed there. We got some dead leaves and stuff at the bottom of the plants, but you're going to have that with any tomato at this point in the game, as hot as it's been lately. But the top of the plants still look really, really good. Still putting on a lot of blooms, not a whole lot of fruit set because it's been so hot out here. But the plant vigor, once planted in this bed, has been quite impressive. And as most of you already know, our climate down here in South Georgia in the summer is pretty rough on tomatoes. We've already called it quits on all our in-ground tomato plants, but these here behind me in the raised beds are still kicking. So the plant vigor in the seedling or getting ready to transplant stage was pretty terrible, but the plant vigor once in the ground has been pretty impressive now for the fruit production itself i haven't been that impressed with the fruit production we've got a decent amount of fruits off here but nothing like we would traditionally get with any other cherry tomato variety 
Now that could have something to do with the fact that we planted these things late. We didn't mean to plant them late, just took that long for us to get some transplants ready to go in the ground. So they did get planted a little late and it may have gotten too hot for them to set fruits. So that may be why our fruit production has not been as great as it should have been, but important to note nonetheless. Now let's talk about the fruits themselves. Now as you may have noticed from me waving this little jewel around for the last few minutes, these are not very big tomatoes. They are on the larger end of the cherry tomato scale, but I would still call it a cherry tomato. They're bigger than those Torangina orange cherry tomatoes I showed you earlier. Bigger than most cherry tomatoes we grow, but still not very big. They're about the same size as a large muscadine in my opinion. And that was one thing that wasn't made very clear on the Norfolk Seed website when I purchased these seeds. It's obvious now that they had those pictures blown up quite a bit and they made these things look like they were about three or four times this size. Not the size of a full slicing tomato, but about the size of a salad tomato. So they're not near as big as what I felt like they were advertised to be and uh, maybe there's a reason for that. I don't know but now you can see just how big they get. And as I mentioned earlier the outside of mine do have a little bit of a purple hue to them, but they're almost brown. Now I had someone comment on our short video and say that they think I have left mine on the plants too long and they were overripe. But I can tell you just by the feel of these, they're not overripe. These are just right, but for whatever reason, they've kind of turned brown here in my garden. Could be that the sun's just working on them that hard and when the sun beats on them, they start to turn a little bit brown, but they're not, I dropped it. They're not as purple as the pictures I saw on the website when I bought these seats. But the inside of these, which is supposed to be a nice vibrant purple color, is as advertised. You can see the color right there. Hopefully the light lets you see that. So I've never seen a tomato that looked like that on the inside. So that part is advertised and with it being purple like that, there's no doubt in my mind that it has more anthocyanins than a traditional tomato does. And now the question that I'm sure everyone is wondering, does a cherry tomato that's purple on the inside taste any better than a cherry tomato that's say orange or red on the inside? Now I've obviously already eaten quite a few of these, but we'll try once again just to make sure here. They're pretty meaty. They got a really good texture to them. The flavor just doesn't pop. It is very, very average in my opinion. It's not awful. It's not the worst tasting tomato I've ever had, but it doesn't blow your doors off either. This, in my opinion, doesn't even come close to that orange Torangina I showed you earlier. So very, very average on the taste scale, in my opinion. Now I have heard some people say that they absolutely loved it. Best tasting tomato they've ever had. Just knock their socks off. I don't know if those people have maybe haven't tried a bunch of different cherry tomatoes or maybe they taste better in some people's gardens than they do in my gardens. But I'm not blown away by it. Important to note, some people do seem to be blown away by it though. So that's our comprehensive review of the plants and the fruits themselves. Now another question we've been getting a lot lately, would you grow it again and are the seeds worth the money? So to answer that question, no, I would not grow it again. Although these are mighty, mighty pretty, the lack in taste and flavor doesn't warrant me giving this variety a spot in my garden in future years. So I'm not going to grow it again. I'm not even going to save any seeds from these. I should have mentioned earlier, just because something is GMO doesn't mean it's also not open pollinated. So you can save the seeds from these and replant them. You just can't sell the seeds based on the terms you agree to when you buy the seeds from the Norfolk Seed website. And to answer the second part of that question, no, I don't think these are worth $2 a seed. There are some seeds out there that are worth paying $2 a seed, but this isn't it. 
However, if you're just curious and have an extra 20 bucks laying around, not going to hurt to give them a try at least once. Like I said earlier, there are some people out there just raving about the taste of these things, although they don't impress me at all. So you could fall into that bucket and you could just fall in love with these things as opposed to just feeling kind of meh about them like I do. And as far as my long-term prognostication on this GMO purple tomato goes, I'm not sure it's ever really going to take off and be a home run for the backyard gardener market. I know there are a lot of people that wanted to try it this year that couldn't try it because they either ran out of seeds or quit selling seeds in, say, late spring. So I'm sure next year they'll have a lot of people that heard about it, maybe even via this video, that want to give it a try at least once. But I just can't see them getting a lot of repeat buyers for these seeds out there. Yes, some people will save the seeds and replant them. Just can't imagine someone growing this and thinking, yeah, I gotta buy some more of those next year. So I'm not sure this thing ever takes off for the backyard gardener market, but I do see some room for it in the commercial or production space. I could see where restaurants would like to put this on a plate because it looks so pretty here if people could get past the idea that it's GMO. So I could see where high-end restaurants might want to have some of these in their dishes. I could also see these, assuming the outside was purple like it was supposed to be, I could also see these being sold in grocery stores as long as the GMO part didn't scare people. You know, a little clamshell of these would look really, really pretty on a shelf, especially if it had a picture of what the inside looks like. So there may be some room for it on the consumer side, but I don't know that it ever becomes a staple in a majority of backyard gardens across the country. So I hope you enjoyed the video today, and if you grew this GMO purple tomato, please do share in the comments below how it performed for you, how you thought it tasted, and if you missed that first video where we went into a little more detail about GMOs and this specific variety, you can see that right here. So check that out, and we'll see you next time right here at Lazy Dog Farm.